Jack Davis Jr. was a 20-year-old sophomore attending Indiana University of Pennsylvania. On Friday, October 16, 1987, Jack and several of his fraternity brothers took part in their normal weekend kickoff routine. They bounced between multiple parties and hangouts on campus and around town. Jack lived off campus at the time with a few roommates, and while it was normal for Jack to get in late, this time he didn't come home. Five days would pass, during which time Jack was nowhere to be found. Then on Wednesday, October 21st, Jack's body was discovered at the bottom of an outside stairwell of Wyant Hall, just off Oakland Avenue. An autopsy was performed and it was initially hypothesized that Jack had gotten drunk and either fallen down the stairs on accident or as the result of losing consciousness, at which time he asphyxiated on his own vomit. His death was ruled accidental. Jack's family felt this didn't answer all of their questions, and so they hired renowned forensic pathologist Cyril Wecht. Dr. Wecht had issues with the original findings, as he found it was highly unlikely that Jack could have been at the bottom of a stairwell for five days without being noticed. While Jack had been drinking the night he disappeared, toxicology showed no alcohol in his blood. According to Dr. Wecht, Jack would have had to have been alive for at least 30 hours after drinking for there to be no trace of alcohol in his blood, which would place his death on Sunday the 18th at the earliest. Another bizarre factor was that Jack had been clean shaven on Friday night, but when his body was discovered, there was heavy stubble on his face. Dr. Weck also found no particles of food in Jack's lungs, suggesting he had not died due to choking on his own vomit. When examining Jack's cranial cavity, which the previous autopsy had not done, Dr. Weck discovered evidence of three fractures to the skull. The body also lacked the abrasions and bruises which would have been consistent with falling down the stairs. Finally, it had rained in the days before Jack was found, and yet his clothing was completely dry. In the years since, several strange details have been discovered. A former police officer came forward to acknowledge that, in the days before his death, Jack had asked for protection. Also, Jack's fraternity was not officially recognized by the college, and had several members who were known to be dealing drugs or participating in other criminal acts. Despite all of the contradictions in this case, local police have never changed their stance that Jack's death was purely accidental. Twenty-one-year-old Suzanne Joven was attending Yale University in 1998. On the evening of December 4th at approximately 9.02 p.m., Suzanne emailed a friend explaining that she was going to leave some books for her in the lobby, but she needed to get them back from someone else she'd loaned them to. She logged off her computer eight minutes later at 9.10. Suzanne then left her apartment and headed over to the Yale police to return the keys to a car she'd borrowed. At 9.22, she ran into a classmate. She explained that she was very tired and hadn't gotten much sleep before continuing on her way. She officially returned the keys at 9.25. She was last seen by another student between 9.25 and 9.30. Suzanne had been seen on College Street, and she was either admiring some holiday lighting, waiting for someone, or just pausing before continuing her walk back. At 9.55 p.m., police received a 911 call reporting a female bleeding on the corner of Edge Hill and East Rock Roads, just under two miles away from Yale's campus. Officers arrived at 9.58 and found Suzanne lying on her stomach, feet in the road, body on the grass between the sidewalk and the street. She had been stabbed 17 times in the back of the head and neck as well as having had her throat slit. The killer had stabbed Suzanne so brutally that the blade of the knife had broken off in her skull. There were no signs of robbery, as Suzanne had cash in her pocket and was still wearing her watch and earrings. 
DNA was taken from beneath Suzanne's fingernails and a bottle of Fresca found nearby had both Suzanne's fingerprints and the partial palm print of an unidentified individual. Several witnesses reported seeing a brown van in the area prior to Suzanne's body being discovered, as well as an athletic man in his 20s or 30s wearing a green jacket who had been seen running in the opposite direction of Suzanne's body. Investigators believed Suzanne had met someone on campus who had driven her to the site of her murder. The DNA found beneath Suzanne's fingernails wasn't tested for three years, and when they got a match, it was to an evidence technician which seemed to suggest the sample had been compromised and handled improperly. Within days of the murder, authorities set their sights on James Van de Velde, one of Suzanne's professors. Despite reports that Suzanne didn't get along with Van de Velde and that she had been trying to get an appointment to see her professor, but that he had been busy and failed to get back to her, it was speculated that the two had engaged in an affair. Neither the DNA nor the palm print from the bottle were matched to Van de Velde, and yet he was the only suspect ever officially named. He would later sue the police and Yale University, who settled with him out of court. State's attorney Michael Deerington admitted, following the lawsuit, that Van de Velde was no longer a suspect. Rumors later circulated about a student who had attended Yale at the same time and who also fit the description given by several witnesses and who often wore a green jacket. The student was said to be psychologically troubled and later committed suicide by smashing his car into a concrete divider, exiting it, and running into oncoming traffic. When investigators sought to examine the student's computer, they found his parents had erased the hard drive, allegedly at their son's request. Suzanne's murder remains unsolved. Eighteen-year-old Lynn Schultz was a freshman at Middlebury College in Vermont. On December 10th, 1971, the young woman was getting ready to take final exams prior to going home for the holiday break. At 12.30 p.m., Lynn was seen outside of a local health food store near a bus stop eating dried prunes. She apparently mentioned that she was planning to take a bus to New York, but that bus had already left. Lynn returned to her dorm and at 12.55 p.m. was seen walking with a group of friends on their way to take a final. Suddenly realizing she'd forgotten her favorite pen, Lynn told her friends to go on without her and she'd catch up with them. The exam was scheduled to take place at 1 p.m., but Lynn never showed up. A witness would later report seeing Lynn at approximately 2.15 p.m. standing on Court Street, directly across from the health food store and bus stop she'd been at earlier in the day. This was the last time anyone ever saw Lynn Schultz. Campus police weren't notified of Lynn's disappearance for two days, and when they entered her dorm, they discovered she'd left behind all of her belongings, her checkbook, and her ID. Lynn had reportedly joked about faking her own death and running off, but no one took it seriously as she had written letters home reporting to be homesick, studied hard for her finals, and even registered for classes for the next semester. Lynn wasn't failing any classes, loved her English drama class, and had perfect attendance. In 2015, authorities announced they were considering Robert Durst as a potential suspect in Lynn's disappearance. In 1971, Durst and his wife, Kathleen, owned all the good things, the same health food store Lynn had been at the day she disappeared. Kathleen disappeared 11 years later, in 1982, and Durst was considered the prime suspect. Sadly, both of Lynn's parents passed away in the 1990s, but her sister is alive and maintains hope that someday they'll discover the truth of what happened to her sister. If you'd like to learn more about the murder of Suzanne Joven, click here to listen to the full-length episode. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. To submit suggestions for future episodes, find social media accounts, and more, 
visit trace-evidence.com or click on the website link here.